And hello, everybody. Welcome to Presence. So glad to have you here. We are going to have a conversation today that fits under our banner, a global conversation for a new earth. And as you all know, in following Presence, we are expanding our awareness of the multitude of different narratives that are happening across the planet that are involved with the evolution of spiritual consciousness. And today I can tell you I'm absolutely delighted to have Reverend Deborah Muldow uh, joining us today. Deborah, welcome to this conversation. Thank you so much, Doug. It's good to be here. And so as I talk briefly with uh, Deborah, rather than me uh, holding up a sheet and reading uh, a bio, which I've got to tell you would be quite a lengthy thing for her to have to sit through because her bio is, uh, is really impressive, although uh, sh she wouldn't say that, but uh, it's full of great experiences. And so what we want to do is uh, talk about the journey that Deborah has gone through, just like the rest of us, and then frame it in terms of uh, the evolutionary development that most of us have gone through in some way or another. And then Deborah and I are going to talk uh, specifically about kind of the state of the union, if you will, with regard to spirituality and uh, the various things that are going on in various movements. So having said that, uh, Deborah, I think a great place to start would be, you know, early in your journey, you weren't always in uh, the things that we're going to talk about here eventually in evolution. So can you just tell us a little bit about how that evolved in your own life? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know how many of us feel that we have some kind of mission uh, in this critical time here on planet Earth. And I feel like uh, a big part of my mission is to live the evolution. So I'm not one of those people who started out on a spiritual path at all. I was a child actress, which is probably the, the complete opposite <laughs> of a spiritual path, or yeah. at least in, in my case, it was. Yeah. Uh, and um, so that was, it was kind of fun when I was a kid, but it was also very uh, challenging, you know, because for every part you get, you get rejected for so many other parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a, it's a challenging path for a kid. Yeah. And then uh, after I graduated from college, I went into musical theater uh, and um, again, had some really, really joyful experiences and some that were devastating. Mm. And I got to a point in my life when I realized that something needed to change. Mm. And uh, I actually sat down in meditation uh, to ask and um, for guidance. Mm. And I heard, it's time for your real work to begin now. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I was like, I'm okay, curious. smarty. So what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I heard be a minister, which was a big surprise to me because um, my family was Jewish. Uh huh. And uh, yet my path to that point had exposed me to uh, many different religions. I was singing uh, uh, in the chorus at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And I was, um, I was uh, reading uh, Yogananda and Ram Das, and I was meditating and, uh, and I was working in Tibetan culture, uh, which was a huge exposure to Tibetan Buddhism and the Dalai Lama and the San Mandalas particularly and all of that. So I really didn't know where, where to go with, <laughs> with be a minister. Yeah. And, um, you know, they say that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And miraculously, through a series of amazing coincidences, within about five days, I found myself at an open house for the new seminary in New York City, which trained interfaith ministers. Wow. Until, until that time, and this was 1991, I didn't know there was such a thing as an interfaith minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I think most people have have heard of it 
Yeah. But the, uh, the founder of the new seminary was a real visionary pioneer named Rabbi Joseph Gelberman. And he founded the seminary with a Swami and a minister and a priest. <laughs> wow, what a, what a diversity. Was, oh my God, it was such a joyful experience. And at that time, I had no idea what I was going to do with that. I didn't see it as a career path in any way, but it was certainly the 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 change of my life and um and rabbi gelberman made it clear that what we were dedicating ourselves to was service mm. that uh having the word reverend before our name meant that we were in service to humanity so that, that made a huge impression on me wow yeah. and uh i started a spiritual counseling practice which was um, going amazingly well. I mean, I had no idea that I could do this until someone came to teach that at the seminary and something, you know, this was, I think the start of my really following my inner guidance was again, I heard you can do that, you know, just do it, start. And I, you know, I met a client who said, oh, do you do this professionally before I was even ordained? And I said, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, start because I really I just I, I learned how to do that deep listening where you really give yourself over to spirit and you you hear what the other person the client is saying that that they need to hear back to them maybe in a different context or in a gentler way or like that mm -hmm. so anyway that was going along really well and I thought I had found what I was put on earth to do but I was counseling people on the weekends and, uh, and after work because my clients all worked. And I thought, you know what? I could have a little part-time job in a nonprofit and have two streams of income and that could be really good. So I was offered a job at the World Peace Prayer Society, which is now called May Peace Prevail on Earth International. And the entire mission of that organization is to spread the prayer, may peace prevail on earth all over the world. <laughs> How beautiful, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's your global uh, perspective. Amazing. And so I would go to work and I would, I would be corresponding with people all over the world about peace and, and uh, spirituality. And then I would go home and go deeply into my clients. And, uh, you know, I just love that except that that job started to expand. And wow. within about six months, I was representing them at the United Nations. And again, my life really changed and, and became much more focused on the, the global scale. Yes. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, I, I actually was the director of, of the Peace Prayer Society for, for a time. And um, I served for them at the United Nations for more than 20 years. Yes, I, I know you did a lot of work at the UN, and of course, uh, uh, you work closely in some some cases with uh, Kurt Johnson, who is well known to our presence crowd. Has been here to our Atlanta facility numerous times, and uh, and Kurt uh, is another one of those who's done a lot of work with the United Nations. Uh, and from our perspective, the the story moves from that um, egocentric, ethnocentric, world centric uh, story where all nations of the earth are walking in the light of this this new awareness. So that fits our narrative beautifully. And uh, so that took you to the UN, and you're working there for 20 years now. You still do a few things in that <laughs> arena, right? You. And, and I can't really, really get away from anything <laughs> that I've done. So I still sing from time to time. And I still, uh, I still definitely promote the prayer, may peace prevail on earth, which will always be in my heart. Right. And uh, yes, I still do uh, work around the United Nations, particularly uh, my focus for uh, certainly the, the, the last few years I was there was really on the International Day of Peace. Oh, yeah. As a time for the world to come together, take a moment of silence, pray for peace, and really be joined in that intention that I think everyone shares. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I've never met anyone who said, no, it's much better for us to be in war and conflict all the time. Nobody wants that. 
So it's really about how do we get from here to there. And when I was at the United Nations and especially doing a lot of work with the other spiritual and religious NGOs there, which are a wonderful community, I met just spectacular people there. And we did all kinds of projects together, including we did an amazing event in 2013 in the General Assembly Hall in celebration of World Interfaith Harmony Week, where we tree of the world, which they, you know, they had said before that, oh, you can't pray in the General Assembly Hall. Well, guess what? <laughs> you can. <laughs> and if you're going to, you need to pray for every country in the world. Right. That's for the UN especially. I know that they're very strict in some of the um, things that they allow if it, if it smacks of religion. So there. And there's that feeling that if you do a, a prayer or a ceremony uh, at the United Nations, that somehow that energy goes out to all corners of the earth. Ah, absolutely. Well, we know that uh, quantum spirituality means everything's connected spiritually. And whenever we vibrate, uh, it moves instantaneously. Um, just like in quantum physics, uh, uh, faster than light, the speed of light even. And uh, so, yeah, we're very much uh, attuned to those kind of things ourselves. But um, so you were, so you were doing that. And now kind of what shifted you to this, this next evolutionary stage of your spiritual journey? Well, I started to realize that the work that I was engaged in at the heart level was about the transformation of human consciousness. Mm. And uh, when I retired from my UN work in 2015, uh, I was moving into two other kinds of work, both related to this transformation of consciousness that I believe is happening on the planet right now yes uh, i believe we are in mid evolutionary leap and that's part of why it feels so <laughs> uncomfortable here right now yeah. is because we haven't landed yet but we're well on our way so the two ways that that manifested in my life was i had this this um deep uh call that came through my interfaith work. So I'd been, obviously I'd been an interfaith minister for a long time by then. I was in, ordained in 1993. Uh, and I was also a founding member of the United Religions Initiative and met so many beautiful souls around the world through that work, which was very dear to my heart. And I was at that time living north of New York City. I'm from Manhattan. Right. Um, yeah. But I was living uh, about an hour north of the city and uh, I was hosting interfaith Sundays at a small Presbyterian chapel in the town that I lived in. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really what got me thinking deeply about what's happening spiritually on the planet now. And I began to see in my own evolution uh, remember I mentioned in the beginning that I feel like I'm part of that evolving consciousness yeah. on the planet. So yeah. I, you know, I didn't start out with any special spiritual <laughs> um, path that I was aware of. Right. Yes. And, and, and yet when I was ordained, it was the interfaith path was perfect for me because I really didn't have any strong beliefs. So I was able to uh, practice different, different uh, beliefs and practices and, right. and uh, prayers and meditations. And uh, I was able to hold these different beliefs kind of lightly, like maybe there's an afterlife. <laughs> you right. know? Yes, yes. That kind of thing. Sure. And um, I realized that by 2015, that I had a set of beliefs that were really very um, much 
uh, a part of me at that point that I didn't have 20 years earlier. That I, uh, and that most people that I knew or people in my circle shared those beliefs. Uh -huh. So those kind of beliefs would be like, for example, that um, we are responsible for co-creating our own reality. Yeah. That we can heal ourselves and one another. Yes. That um, all the religions have wisdom to offer us mm -hmm. and community but none has an exclusive hold on the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, that there is current revelation that people are able to access uh, worlds beyond the one that we can, uh, we can experience through our senses. Right. So all of these kinds of beliefs, and there's, there are a lot of them, I realized was an emergent spirituality that was global, that yeah. didn't depend on people's religion or whether they had religion or not, whether they yeah. considered themselves to be a practicing Hindu yeah. or Muslim or Jew or Christian, yeah. or, or whether they were an atheist, but held these beliefs. Right. Even that the food we eat affects our bodies that we need to eat purer foods if we want to be healthier. You know, we didn't think about that when I was growing up. We right. thought about, you know, what's delicious, what's for dinner, right? They invented, they invented McDonald's in our generation. <laughs> they did. <laughs> so that was the impetus for the Garden of Light. Yeah. I founded this nonprofit. It's a small nonprofit. It's online at gardenoflight.org. And it's simply a platform for the emerging global spirituality. No one was talking about it. No one was examining it, exploring it, curious about it. Yeah. And I thought this is what can really advance the human race. It's happening. Mm -hmm. It's emerging through all of us. Mm -hmm. It's like... Uh, the Christ or the Buddha, not coming back in one person, but through so many open hearts yeah. at this time when we need to evolve quickly if we want the human race to stay on the planet. Yes, yes. And, you know, again, when you're when you're talking about this and again, we I I use the term narrative. I wear that term out. Because uh, everybody's got a story, and in what you what you have been framing as you went on your journey, what I heard you say is your beliefs, in essence, were were uh, turning into a narrative that 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 for you, your narrative was pointing to this this global spirituality, and you you actually had an advantage in the sense that most of us in presence have come from more boundary driven specific. Uh, uh, religious interpretations of spirituality that that were more constrained to a religion and in ways that now people have kind of grown on beyond it, not to denigrate any, any of the things of their past or family members that are still in a more particularized viewpoint of where spirituality is contained. The people that we're talking with are people that have moved to this viewpoint that for you just kind of evolved naturally, but for other people, it came with a lot of conflict because, because some family members stayed there in the particularized boundary driven world while others were evolving into the global spirituality mm -hmm. and unity of all humanity. So uh, that's what's fascinating and why uh, it's so interesting to see that that spiritual impulse you you cannot you cannot confine that on the base on the basis of some boundary driven thinking. So that's that's very much that's very interesting that you really didn't have those constraints to begin with. Well, I think Doug. In fact, you can constrain them that way. Uh, people yeah. have and yeah. successfully for uh, you know yeah. generation upon. Uh, spiritual fulfillment through the religion into which they were born, or in uh, more modern times, perhaps the religion that they've chosen, because it's new to be able to choose your 
people couldn't do that in the past. And uh, uh, the religions, uh, many religions became institutionalized and institutions have a lot of rules and as you say, boundaries. And um, they're not always congruent with, with the deepest part of their beliefs. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I was thinking today about Thomas Jefferson taking his Bible and a pair of scissors and cutting out everything that where it said that Jesus said something. And that's what he made his Bible out of just yes. what, what they said. And, you know, they said it decades after Jesus had already died, but still it was what they said Jesus said. That's yeah. what Thomas Jefferson was interested in. He wasn't interested in all of the, all of the other stuff. So yeah. I think uh, religions tend to have a lot of other stuff. And yeah. uh, also they're often codif they were often codified yeah. uh, in a different time. Yeah. And we are in an exceptional time. Never has most of the planet been educated before. Right. Uh, uh, never has most of the planet or much of the planet been able to learn about one another uh, before and find out that there really is no other, <laughs> that yes. we are all the human family and we are all part and parcel of the earth that gave us birth and sustains us, part of one beautiful living system in a, in a, a universe that we, we have to be humble about how little we, we understand. Yes, absolutely. And that, you know, that again, what you're, you're speaking of is that you have uh, different iterations of understanding even uh, the same narrative that comes from any religion, be it a Buddha narrative or uh, Vedas, Upanishads, or uh, the biblical narrative or the Tao, um, Quran, uh, et cetera. You, you will always have groups of people that hold a more what most people would call fundamental view of that that is that is what most people then begin to feel constrained if if the mm -hmm. fundamentals of it are are missing you know the spiritual uh development from the heart that leads you to to a to an identity that is not based on that religion that is that is mm -hmm. that is actually transcendent uh, to a to a place uh, that is universal, and so uh, that's why we talk about a new earth. That's not geographical; it transcends geography and um, all other forms and and uh, so forth. So uh, that's what I like about and Garden of Light. So, um, how do you see then, kind of? Um, vision of the future as you as you've been in garden of light you really are experiencing this and i know that you had mentioned briefly this idea that sometimes it's not apparent what's going on on the planet and i feel as though the media especially does well when people will click on something and people are very apt to click on something if it seems to be fearful uh, or presenting something of danger because it applies to my instinctual self. You know, I might not be surviving here. And we, and it's not that those things don't exist, and it's not that we're not working to change things. But I think people don't hear the other side of the coin, and that is, so many other people and so many other organizations that are uh, beginning to connect in the spiritual side of the conversation. I'd, I'd like to hear your views on that. Well, Paul Hawken was the first to point this out in his book, Blessed Unrest, where he said that uh, there was the greatest movement happening that no one had ever heard of. Yes. And it was the rise of these organizations doing good all across the planet. Yes. And of course, at the United Nations, it's a, it's a hub for people doing good to come together and uh, learn about each other's work and try to influence the governments. Uh, Etc. So uh, the the evolution that's happening is an internal evolution, and what we're getting externally is more and more chaos. Yes. And yeah. the optimistic part of me actually believes 
that a certain level of chaos is needed for transformational change to take place. Absolutely. So that is, in essence, the evolutionary driver is yeah. the, the desperate situation. And, I, you know, I don't use that word lightly, but yeah. the desperate situation our world is in yeah. when we have an existential threat to the future mm. of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, the earth is ready to recenter her invitation. You know, she's heating up. She's, uh, she's getting restless. And uh, uh, I think a little bit discontented with humanity's constant conflict and uh, exploitation. And this is the moment when we need to make this evolutionary leap. And I think that's what can save us for the future is, yes. is for people to, to be, begin to wake up to the fact that we're all in this together. We share this beautiful planet. We have been polluting her and uh, mistreating her, not considering the, the life force of Gaia yes. that, that it lives and breathes within us, but also within the, the the trees and the rivers and, and the plants and the animals and the oceans. And these are precious living entities. They are not simply resources to be exploited. And this is this realization is part of the spirituality that we're awakening to our oneness as not only a human family, but a planetary family of life that must yeah. be nurtured and sustained and is really much more important than becoming a billionaire. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're like, we're like built a box and we're living right. in this crazy, almost insane. Uh, well, you, know, you like, you like to sing and, and I'm a huge fan of the Beatles and they told us a long time ago that money can't buy you love. So I think uh, they were saying some things there uh, regarding billionaires and otherwise, you know, this idea that, um, the necessity of chaos, um, mm -hmm. as you know, we use a lot of models to kind of trace the biblical narrative through its uh, levels, mm -hmm. what Ken Wilber would call the growing up levels. Spiral Dynamics calls it the same thing, the stages or levels, and that one of the key principles of evolution is called the unworkable, that we human beings, when confronted with the unworkable, are put in a position where we have to sit back and go, well, now what am I gonna do? Or what are we going to do? And so when you talk about the necessity of chaos, um, then you can understand that there's, there's a flow with spirit and then there's, there's a resistance to spirit. And, mm -hmm. and we as humans have free choice to, to follow either the flow of spirit or to resist that spirit. And when we resist the spirit, uh, that, inevitably will uh, take us to a place called the corruptible, um, those things that are built on sand, it will inevitably take us to these unworkable places. And so as I look out on this chaos, it's certainly easy for a lot of reasons to be discouraged, but at the same time, these are decisions that we make that can drive us uh, as we all come together like we're doing in this video, to consider uh, how to respond to the chaos, not just become a victim of it, but how we respond to that chaos. I think that's very true. And uh, we, we are seeing such painful things right now that uh, we can't help but respond in a new way. Uh, yeah. We thought that, for instance, I know I was under the misapprehension as an American that we had made enormous strides against racism in, mm -hmm. in, in our country. We had passed the Civil Rights Act in my lifetime and, and there was so much more equal opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea what was seething under the surface. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's very painful to look at it now, but it's absolutely necessary. You, you, you can't heal a, a disease you don't know you have. 
You right. know, you have to, we have to be able to look at these things and, and look at them and also look at our past selves, our past behaviors with, with the heart of compassion Absolutely. and say, now we're seeing it differently and now we need to act differently. That's and it. that is the evolution. Yes. You know? I mean, there did used to be slavery in the Bible. There's slavery. You know, right. it's not just sanctioned. It's a way of life. Yeah. And again, you know, that's why we say when you look through these lenses of uh, tribal and warrior and early eras that the whole planet of consciousness was on as a growing up level, when you look through a certain lens, you, you see that God says, go kill the enemy. And, and, you, and, and you believe that's, that's your understanding of that transcendent power. And, but as you get up into higher levels, you know, you get to a Christ consciousness that says, hey, put down the sword. Uh, my kingdom is not of this nature. And so again, we can see in our story, our human story that we have within ourselves, these potentials, but that as we become more aware, we also understand that the choices we now make can either lead, lead us to that more abundant life, or it can lead us to these places of uh, pain and suffering. Yes. And I really believe that a key narrative in the Bible is the prodigal son. That that is our exploration into the world of the material. Yes. We left our father's house and we went out to see what the world had to offer us. Mm. And uh, we became wealthy. And, uh, you know, in so many ways that our modern civilization has given to us uh, safety and, and opportunities and all of that, but we have forgotten where we came from. Yes. And now it's up to us to, to turn around and make that journey home and know that uh, th there's a feast waiting for us. Yes. And, and what and, and, and how to get that, you know, we're we're moving, I, I think, from this idea of possessing to an idea of stewarding. And, you know, that, again, is, is part of the story that that in the, the biblical narrative, you have this creation. So, as you said earlier, the whole ecosystem is what what the creation centers on in the creation stories is all the ecosystem, that which is in the oceans, on the land, in the air. That's God, that's God in the oceans, God in the land, God in the air, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, mother nature. And uh, then, uh, you know, you get into this modernity that we've, that we're experiencing this very day and consumerism, et cetera, and you turn to a possessing as if you own it. And so yes. you will do with it whatever you feel like is a benefit only to find out uh, that you're doing things that are uh, not bringing you any benefits at all. Imagine that concept of owning land. Yes. I mean, when you think about it, it's completely absurd. All we can do is steward land. We can't ever own it. Right. The earth doesn't belong to individuals. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So you, we've talked a lot about the word evolution. And one of the other things that you are very much involved with is a group called Evolutionary Leaders. Tell us what you do with that group. And then if you would give us some idea of how that group is trying to make this impact. Yes, so that in fact has been the, uh, the other important recent path in my life. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Um, Diane Williams who is a dear friend and a visionary, started in 2006 uh, an organization called the Source of Synergy Foundation. And she asked me to be on the board. And uh, in fact, she asked me to be the treasurer, which I thought was a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to help Diane. So uh, I came on board, not fully getting the vision but uh, as we began to hold meetings first of leaders of different organizations in New York at uh, a hotel that Deepak Chopra, where Deepak Chopra had a, uh, uh, some space at that time and he had offered Diane to have these meetings there. 
and then in California at his center in Carlsbad. And uh, through this process, the evolutionary leaders circle was born. And uh, in the beginning, uh, it was a small group. In California, we had 35 people and a lot of them were very well-known authors and uh, visionaries and like, um, like Deepak and like um, uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard and Gene Houston and Joan Borisenko and Greg Braden and Bruce Lipton and on and on. Yeah. Uh, all just wonderful souls who had dedicated their work to what we were calling conscious evolution. Yeah. And that phrase, of course, came from Barbara Marks Hubbard. I, I don't know if she originated it, but she certainly uh, made it known yeah. that we were at a very special place in the history of humanity. Uh, in fact, in the history of life on this planet where evolution had always taken place, but this was the first time we could choose. Yes. How do we want to evolve? In what direction? And how quickly are we willing to, to move to get there? Yeah. And uh, so this group, the Evolutionary Leaders, has grown over the years. We have almost uh, 200 members there. They, they select new members from within uh, from time to time. And uh, now with so many, we have many who are less well-known, but much more uh, active in mm -hmm. so many different domains, authors and scientists and teachers and uh, people in the field of actually expanding our consciousness. We have musicians and artists because that's important too sure. in building this new paradigm uh, yeah. of, of consciousness. So it's wonderful. Yeah, uh, Evolutionary Leaders has a website at evolutionaryleaders.net where anybody can go there and sign the call to conscious evolution that came out of that first uh, uh, meeting in Carlsbad, uh, where Bruce Lipton stood up and he said, You know, when the founding fathers wanted to start something new, they had a declaration. I think we should have a declaration. So uh, everyone got together and co-wrote this uh, call to conscious evolution. And um, more recently, uh, 43 of our evolutionary leaders came together to contribute chapters to a book. So we put out a book a year ago called Our Moment of Choice, yeah. Evolutionary Visions and Hope for the Future. And this is a little sampling of all your favorite authors. <laughs> yeah, including and, you. Oh yes, including me. <laughs> and uh, including Kurt. And Kurt and I and Bob Atkinson are the uh, co-editors of this book, which was published by Beyond Words, which is an yes. imprint of Simon & Schuster. And uh, it, we were very excited because we had this title. We had had a, an idea for a book project 10 years earlier and we couldn't get it together. But at that time, Greg Braden had given us this title. Uh -huh. He said his publisher didn't want it. And you know he kind of had it. And did we want to be called our moment of choice, the book? Uh -huh. And we said, yeah, that sounds like a good title. Right. Well, little did we know 10 years later when we actually had this yeah. book come into manifestation, yeah. now is our moment of choice. And Jean Houston always says, this is the time and we are the people. She says, other times thought they were the time, but they were wrong. Well, this is the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is so clearly our moment of choice. And it came out right in mid pandemic mm. when we yeah. actually had the opportunity as a global society to take a pause and think, how do we want to go forward into the future? Yes. So this yes. book has a lot of ideas around that. <laughs> and there's yeah, a and at our we, moment of choice.com. And, and we will have that and evolutionary leaders and uh, garden of light, all these, uh, the book, uh, we'll have a link to that. And when we send this video out, those of you watching already know you've read uh, the intro that I've got to this in the newsletter with all these links in here. And again, we're making all these available because uh, Deborah is doing a very uh, broad brush view 
uh, that she could literally sit here for the next week and talk about uh, just literally hundreds of people, hundreds of organizations that are behind this, this movement, if you will, uh, that, that are, that's, that's happening and that really brings to light what uh, I was uh, asking, and that is what's the other side of the chaos? And uh, that's the beauty of why um, people like Deborah are uh, making such a contribution because um, there are so many now that are feeling this call, whatever you want to, uh, however you want to term that, uh, this, this impulse that comes in, in all of us, the reason that we uh, do all the content and videos and the things that we do and have our collectives uh, within uh, presence. And then presence is saying, well, uh, we're not a thing that you, that you join. We're, we're, we're a connector group. So look, here's Deborah. Look, there's more things we can connect to. <laughs> and I think really this is a sign to uh, we talk again in our group, they're very familiar with the spiral. So uh, I would just bring this point up here that initially, I think over the last 20 years, as the beginning of integral took place in uh, what uh, spiral calls the yellow uh, lens, uh, the first part of second tier, that you, you get a lot of individualism, meaning there's a person here, there's a person here, there's a person here, there's a person on this part of the world. And it's kind of like popcorn a kernel pops here and a kernel pops there. Turquoise is the next uh, integral stage where you get the collectives. And what, what you're talking about, Deborah, are the multitude of ways that you're contributing to bringing all these evolutionary leaders who then have a, a following of all these people. And now we're, cross, we're doing the cross-pollinization, right? Absolutely. And in fact, that is one of the hallmarks of the new paradigm. Uh, I remember a wonderful little presentation that one of our evolutionary leaders, a real visionary named Nipun Mehta, mm -hmm. who started uh, the Karma Kitchens and uh, uh, Service Space, I think is his, his website. He was talking about how we're moving from the one-to-many teaching model to the many-to-many. -many. Oh. And that to me was a, a huge revelation because not only is our whole civilization set up that way as a one to many, but every, every religion has, uh, almost every religion, not everyone, but almost everyone has a person who stands up in the front, yeah. right? Who, who gives the word. Right. And uh, schools, that's the teacher, and then it's the student. So I'm the one who knows, yes. and I'm going to tell you what you yes. need to learn from yes. me. Right. And he said the new model is the many to many, and that's what the internet has given us, where we can all talk to one another. Yeah. And, you know, that has created chaos and misinformation. These are the stumbling blocks along the way as we learn uh -huh. to, to teach love. You yeah. know, you can teach a lot of other things on the internet and still be going many to many and building your following. But yeah. the power is in the love. Yeah. So once we start teaching love as the many to many, and isn't this what Jesus wanted when he sent his, his apostles out? into yes. the world you know yes. this is go out and 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 share the love yeah not teach the doctrine yes not tell people that they're going to 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 go to hell for eternity right. if they don't follow the rules mm -hmm. uh, that it's not the jesus that i know anyway <laughs> well and and again the same is true obviously for our our group as well as you well know and so yeah, this again is all in the evolution of this. And for those of us that grew up and started in that more uh, boundary driven thinking where it was my doing that achieved and maintained my identity rather than realizing that it was spirit as source and that it was innate to me and not from me, uh, you actually can go do those things and you can actually strive to keep those boundaries and do the right thing. But 
it becomes truly a, a yoke and and you find and you find that it's not leading you to uh, the fullness of life at all. And uh, you 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 then get into paradigms of judging and, and other things only because you feel that you must in order to be sure that you're okay. And there's always this fear that maybe I'm not enough or maybe I'm not okay, or maybe I won't be accepted uh, by the higher power, however you your narrative interprets that. So, uh, so much of this does lead from brokenness to healing. And, and the one thing, you know, you were talking about the Eastern narratives and the people you've worked with from, from all the different backgrounds. And, uh, for me, this, this idea and all the narratives of transformation, I mean, that's what evolution is, it's transformation, and we're all beginning to realize that, that, the heart, that what a human is is a transformative being. I mean, we're, we're always constantly transforming, and that that transformation allows me to be okay with where I was in the past and and to understand, forgive myself for I know not what I do in the sense of, yeah, that's where I was at that time. And, and I may have even taught things at that time that I would never teach at this time in my life. But I also have to realize that that's part of my evolution and part of my transformation. And it's your conscious evolution. Yes, exactly. Is because there you are aware and you're watching. And, and I actually have a recipe for it, a very simple recipe that's worked in, in my life. I call it following the breadcrumbs. <laughs> because spirit always seems to put in front of me what I need to do next, where I need to go next, what I need to put my attention on, where I need to open my heart. And if you're paying attention you can follow your own breadcrumbs. I'm very happy because my breadcrumbs led me to this beautiful city you see behind me, which is San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And how did you get there? We've got to hear that before we conclude <laughs> for the day. I, I often before, ask myself. Manhattan. <laughs> that's why I'm sure it was spirits doing, you know, because Mexico was never on my horizon. I am fluent in French. <laughs> I was, I was never going to Mexico, uh, except to enjoy just the beautiful country and culture, but uh, never thought I would live here. But um, I, I discovered that this was where I was supposed to be by, by listening and paying attention to the signs. I was interested in, when I reached a certain age, putting some focus on creating a conscious retirement community. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for what place would have what I was looking for, uh, for the right environment for that. I wanted good weather and um, uh, uh, I wanted a developing country where it wouldn't be expensive, something not too far from the states where people with grandchildren could come pop down and, and back up. And, and I didn't want to be on a coast because of climate change. Wow. So when I looked at all of those things, I also wanted a language that I had a, 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 a fair chance with, right. <laughs> at right. least in our alphabet. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, Mexico, but not on the coast. I, uh, where would that be? And uh, I remembered a friend whom I had done. Um, she had organized a beautiful peace event after 9-11 in Woodstock. New York, where she was living, and uh, had asked me to bring the World Peace Prayer Society there and um, to participate in this event. And since then, I'd been getting notices of a little apartment that she was renting here in San Miguel. And I had other friends who had spent time in San Miguel, and I thought, I, I should know about this place. Yeah. You know? And I looked it up online, and oh my God. 10 best places to retire, most beautiful city in the world, uh, all this kind of stuff, yeah. and including what it costs to live here. And I went, oh my God, I could live on my retirement income, which I could never do in the United States. Right. Like, how is this possible? And um, so I was thinking, well, you know, I'll go visit and I'll see if I like it. And then I'll go stay for a longer amount of time. And I sat down in meditation and I heard, speed it up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, seven months later, I was 
I had moved Lock, Stock and Barrel uh, down to San Miguel and I've never regretted it. It's a, a beautiful uh, culture here that both the international, it's an arts mecca. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots of artists and musicians and writers and creative people and also deep indigenous culture here and uh, the mix of the Spanish and, and the indigenous, it's just truly an extraordinary place and um, a beautiful climate indeed. So I feel very blessed to be here. But again, it was step by step, it was listening to the prompts yes. that took me someplace where I never expected to be. Yes. In, in every way. I mean, I thought I was, when I was a little girl, I thought I was born to be on stage. <laughs> and you were for a while. And I was, yeah. But um, as the voice said to me, um, eventually it was time for my real work to begin. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's again, I think that's that common theme. And <clears throat> excuse me, that's what encourages people is to realize that we're all uh, following the breadcrumbs that... Uh, that, that as we become more aware, we actually seek and, and try to find those breadcrumbs. We, we knock for the next door to be open for us. And the more we're aware of the way those things work, the more those things begin to lead us more naturally and, and wherever it might take us. And usually it's something that we would never think or imagine as you just outline so that's how you know that you're really hearing something that it's not you're not just talking to yourself although yes. maybe it's our higher self that's talking who knows yeah well you know again uh this is helping all of us to understand that the the really the only power that exists uh that has always existed is that power of spirit and that spirit hovered over the waters and, and, and created and spirit transforms. And um, in the biblical narrative, Paul says that the source of unity is not uh, humans making it happen, but it's unity of the spirit, meaning that we, when we realize that spirit is our source, and that we are all uh, of the same human value, if you will, the same value equation, then allowing spirit to be the source of what we do keeps me humble. Uh, it, it, it allows me to forgive myself for the things that I'm still uh, uh, trying to strengthen in my life, and it encourages me to follow those breadcrumbs. So um, these are the conversations that uh, really inspire us, and i can't thank you enough for the inspiration that you brought to our group today. Well, thank you so much. It, 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 it's always my joy to be able to go deep with someone and talk about these things that are really meaningful, to yeah. take a break from uh, the chaos of the world and the news and the headlines and talk about what matters. So congratulations for Presence TV because it's really important in our world today. Well, I appreciate it, Deborah, And that's going to conclude our uh, wonderful uh, conversation with uh, Deborah today, Global for uh, the New Earth. And we appreciate you all investing your time in this same uh, conversation. All of us, every single one of us has a role to play uh, in this story. And spirit is the power behind it, not uh, some importance that we assign to an individual. For that, thank you again, Deborah, And we will talk to you all next time. Well, I think so. <laughs>